All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Please have a, a seat. Um, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is uh, Stan Voiger, Senior Fellow here at AEI, and I'm delighted to host today's event on uh, EU and US, U.S. approaches to big tech. Uh, good morning as well to our online viewership, somewhere behind those cameras. Um, uh, for our online viewers, please submit any questions you may have to beatrice.lee at AI.org or via Twitter with hashtag AskAIECon. Now, uh, rapid developments in artificial intelligence have policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic uh, scrambling to respond. The EU's recently approved AI Act would regulate a wide range of applications deemed to pose privacy, national security, product safety, and other risks. The Biden administration's executive order on AI has adopted a similarly multifaceted uh, approach, touching on discrimination, fraud, immigration, bio threats, and, and uh, myriad other issues. The EU, with its uh, Digital Markets and Digital Services Act, also continues to play a leading role in regulating the broader, the broader technology sector outside uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, meanwhile, American antitrust policymakers appear to be moving in the direction of, the, of their European counterparts, with their attention shifting from preventing uh, harm to consumers, however narrowly defined, to seeing company size and, and, and market power as intrinsically problematic. Uh, who better to discuss these uh, issues with than with our guest today, uh, Margrethe Vestager. Uh, Mrs. Vestager is Executive Vice President of the European Commission for a Europe fit for, a, for the digital age, as well as European Commissioner for Competition. She has been in, the, in her former position as, uh, since tw in 2019 and in the latter position since 2014. She's also co-chair of the Trade and Technology Council. Um, she previously, previously served in various cabinet positions in her home country of Denmark, where she also led the Social uh, Liberal Party. According to Wikipedia, and feel free to deny this, you served as inspiration for the television show uh, Borgen, uh, of which Netflix recently released a uh, fourth and additional season. Uh, Madam Executive Vice President, welcome to AI. Well, thank you very much. So, um, I know you spoke at the Institute of Advanced Study uh, uh, yesterday. Yes. And you. The day before. Yeah, day before. yesterday. Uh, oh my uh, God. A lot, no, of, a lot of stuff happening. Must be the eclipse. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, someone, I, I, I saw there was, there, was some, there was some debate over whether you're allowed, if you're fasting for Ramadan, whether you're allowed to break the fast during the eclipse or not. Oh. Uh, and so maybe it does count as an additional night. Um, anyway, so you there, you compared artificial intelligence to atomic energy hmm. uh, in, I, I suppose, both its, its threat and its promise. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on that, on that analogy and, and how that has influenced your, your thinking about policy? Yeah, so, so looking back uh, at atomic uh, energy, obviously a lot of our societies are today fueled by atomic energy. Uh, a lot uh, comes from that, obviously good. Uh, when the nuclear bomb was uh, invented, uh, it didn't just change sort of warfare, it changed the entire approach to conflict. And, and I think it's, it's underlined by the fact that even during the Cold War, it was possible for enemies to align on the non-proliferation uh, treaty because the consequences are so massive that no one would bear the cost. And looking at artificial intelligence, which is, you know, it has no sort of predefined purpose. It's not like someone has reinvented social media or uh, customer service. It's really pervasive, meaning that you can use it for everything, which means that it will potentially also change everything. So it can lead us to a completely uh, new approach to what society, how, how it's working, what work is like. And, uh, and I think that you can only embrace that kind of technology if you can trust it actually to serve people. And just as with nuclear, uh, there is this question about an existential threat. And that should not be ignored. But the thing is that uh, as AI is being used today, there may be existential threats to the individual. Uh, if AI by bias doesn't enable you to be accepted to university even though you fulfill the criteria, if it doesn't enable you to get a mortgage or an insurance, well, your life will be very different from what was otherwise possible. And, uh, and this is why, as of now, it's important to make sure that we are uh, getting control of the risks of uh, biases in, in high-risk situations while enabling the use of AI in, in so many other use cases. I think health is an obvious one. 
uh, fighting climate change is another uh, obvious one, probably not possible uh, without artificial intelligence. So I think that is, that is the balance. And this is why I said uh, yesterday that we have this 1955 moment. Uh, the world ought to come together to figure out we have different approaches to AI, but there are fundamental issues that we ought to uh, decide together. To, to push you a bit more on individual risk, um, I, I, under, I, I understand people have concerns about discrimination, about, about you know, false positives, false negatives. In, in all sorts of settings. Surely that's true in the health context as well. Why, why the concern about, um, about the, you know, the error rate in certain contexts and, and not in others? Shouldn't the relevant comparison be the error rate compared to whatever the error rate is now as opposed to some you know, situation where we may never get to of 100% yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's okay. an excellent point uh, because when we look at our physical reality, it's so not perfect. Uh, so we have law enforcement, you know, we have, um, we have uh, speed limits, and yet people are speeding. So we have law enforcement uh, to, to get in control of that, and yet it's still happening. But I think we have a different uh, and much lower tolerance for errors made by machines than for errors made by humans. Because we can mirror ourselves in another human who makes a mistake. We cannot mirror ourselves in a machine where it may be completely intransparent, completely black box, why a decision has been taken. And I think that's, that's an important difference between human and machine uh, also in this. And you being Dutch, you will, you will know the Dutch scandal. Uh, AI was uh, applied for uh, the distribution of social benefits. It got it all wrong. Uh, that took down first a minister and then a government. Uh, and I think that shows that we have a very low tolerance. To be clear, this is AI in the sense of like searching through databases. Yes. Very, yeah. very basic, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but my point would yeah. be to say that, you know, in Europe we have very large public sectors. If AI can be used to make that more efficient, uh, to improve the quality, uh, you know, it will be market creating for trustworthy AI. So just as well as we see the scandals and have a different expectation of machines, there's also an enormous potential. And so when you think of the, the new AI Act, you, even though, of course, the legislation is very focused on eliminating risks or mitigating risks, you think that just by mitigating the risks and the associated popular discontent about you know, errors that AIs will make, you think that that in and of itself will promote the development of more productive technologies? I, I do think that our AI Act is, is uh, a market-making piece of legislation because trustworthiness is, is what will make people embrace it, at least in a European context. And uh, in some countries, the public sector is give or take half the GDP. Uh, so you really need uh, you know, to be able to apply uh, artificial intelligence in these many uh, different uh, instances. And the second thing that we've been very careful with the approach, that it is not an approach to the technology in itself, because that has developed dramatically. Uh, ChatGBT wasn't even launched uh, when we tabled the proposal. We've been very careful to maintain a focus on the use cases because technology will develop. I, I don't consider it possible for legislation to follow technological development as such, but we can focus on the use cases and making sure that we have a no-touch approach to what is considered low on, or very low risks, but that we are crunching in uh, on what may be uh, risky and also on what we find would actually not uh, match what we believe, like social scoring, uh, like government surveillance uh, and point systems, we know that AI is used for that in other jurisdictions, or for embedding AI, for instance, in toys uh, that can have malicious uh, uh, effects. I see. And so, if you, I don't know how, to what extent you think of this as, you know, part of a competition in a broader geopolitical context. But so, do, do you think that that approach, so the marketing, mar the market enabling. Uh, process of, of mitigating risks. Do you think that that will put the European AI industry ahead of China, the US? How do you think of that competition of your approach to regulating versus um, what, what China and the US have been doing? 
No, I, I don't think so. Okay. I, I really don't think so. For, for, for us, I think the, the promise of, of uh, being ahead in, in what some of the AI sectors would be when AI is embedded in machinery. Absolutely. Europe has a very strong industrial tradition, a very strong tradition of producing machinery to produce <coughs> machinery. Uh, and I think it's, it's that uh, tradition where AI will, will change the approach. Because uh, even though now we are paving the way for, for small and medium-sized companies to use the network of hyperscale computers to develop AI, uh, it's a different approach than to what we see in the US. So a lot of, uh, of the US businesses will have, I think, an excellent business in Europe uh, playing by a rule book that makes sure that it's not risky to use. So, and the second thing is that from the very so, so perhaps a little bit the way it is now for uh, other elements, uh, other think components so, yes, of the sector. Definitely, I, I think so. Uh, but the second thing is that where we were uh, maybe a bit too late in, in uh, getting a, a more uh, regulatory grip on big tech uh, with all the consequences of that, of markets closing in and smaller businesses not having a fair chance of making it. When it comes to AI, there's much more alignment also globally. Uh, we aligned with, uh, within the Ta Trade and Technology Council on the approach to AI. Now we are discussing, for instance, can we set a standard for a common transatlantic standard for what does red teaming mean? What does it mean that someone has tested uh, your uh, AI uh, to, and to certify that it's safe? Because you know it could be a lot of different things. If we can set a standard, well, then we can also enable a transatlantic marketplace. And, and the same line of thinking goes with the work that is led by the Japanese uh, under the very telling uh, uh, headline of the Hiroshima process that has produced the G7 code of conduct when it comes to AI. So there is a, a global momentum. Uh, and of course, the next steps would be to make sure that more and more countries uh, come on board for uh, the high risk uh, use cases. Th this is, of course, all happening at a time when you also see some fracturing of the the global economy may be certainly some movement from the U.S. towards separating its tech industry and, and that of allied countries from the Chinese economy. Um, of course, we, we saw the U.S. government you know, effectively strong arm the Dutch government into imposing export restrictions on ASML. We now have a debate here on forcing ByteDance to divest from, from um, from TikTok, uh, Europe hasn't quite been as aggressive. I think. Um, how, how do you how do you think about Chinese investment in the tech industry? Sort of, uh, people don't decoupling. People now think of it as a very aggressive term, but you know, moving some tech companies away from interacting really at all with with it, with China and the Chinese government. How do you, what do you what is your approach there? What do you think of Europe's approach? Well, we have been uh, latecomers to have a European approach to economic security. Uh, but what we have seen in the last years is a development from our view of China. Uh, we made a Chinese China strategy a couple of years ago, <coughs> some years ago. We see China as a partner in fighting climate change. We see it as a systemic rival when it comes to governance. Uh, we see it as an economic competitor. More and more, the two latter legs are being intertwined that economic competition and the systemic rivalry uh, sort of works together. And, uh, and this is why we have developed a number of tools uh, in order to uh, deal with that. They are country agnostic, they could be used for other countries as well, but uh, what we have seen has been quite a lot China related. So uh, they are welcome to do business in Europe, but it must be fair play. So we have the foreign subsidies regulation uh, that has been used to question, uh, for instance, bits uh, for uh, establishing uh, solar panels. We have an ongoing investigation to that. For bits establishing in wind farms, we have an investigation ongoing to that. We had an investigation already in bits into trains in Bulgaria, and the Chinese state-owned business simply withdraw uh, from that. So we have a number of tools, but our thinking right now is that we need to develop a more horizontal approach as to what can actually be trusted. Uh, because when you look, for instance, at um, 
connected vehicles, they will sense everything on their way. They will connect enormous amounts of data. And in order to make sure that we can trust the semiconductors that goes in there, we would want to develop sort of trustworthiness criteria. It can be sustainability, it can be working condition, it can be a number of things. And if we did that with the US, within uh, AG7 and uh, friends um, atmosphere, we could create a market where you would have scale. Also, when you could tick the boxes of trustworthiness uh, criteria. So I think we are, we are uh, changing our approach uh, slightly over the years and also getting member states on board because as you will know, Europe is not a, a federation. Uh, we have a, a, a complex nuanced relationship with member states and we do not plan to move competence from individual member states to uh, Brussels, so to speak, because that would give us a turf war and no results. So we'd rather have this sort of European prism through which member states will exercise their national competences. Uh, that could be export controls uh, as one. I see. But so you think of the European role as one focused on economic security, one that's neutral across third countries, and the member states are in charge of more national security oriented, China-specific policies. Well, well, yes and no, <laughs> uh, because we will not take away or suggest. The no part I'm interested in. No, no, yeah, but yeah, we, yeah. Will, we, will, we will not suggest to, to change the distribution of competences here. But we would want the interplay between our European democracy and member state competence to change, <laughs> to be more, horizont more uh, European in its perspective. Because otherwise there is a risk that member states will uh, be coerced uh, by China. We have examples uh, of that, and we have uh, uh, developed new tools to prevent uh, coercion, uh, but also that we sub-optimize as to what we want to achieve. And since we can achieve a number of these things better in partnering up with the US, uh, this is part of what we would want to do. I see. Now, let's talk about the relationship with the US, uh, as you're, you're here. Um, uh, there, I think, is a perception that, of course, you are very familiar with, that a lot of European first antitrust policy, then um, anti-state aid policy, now digital policy, um, is you know barely concealed sort of anti-American protectionism. Um, you know this started with the maybe the Apple tax case. Now in the the Digital Markets Act, you see that the Companies that have been identified as gatekeepers are, you know, all but one are American, uh, I think. Um, and I would worry, maybe, that that, you know, introduces tension in the transatlantic relationship that is not super productive in the context of those broader, of those broader goals. How, how do you think of that of that trade-off? Well, I think it has it has changed. Uh, from, from the very first days when, when I was uh, uh, on the Hill with uh, having, uh, taking the first Google case uh, further on, people think, what is that crazy woman doing? You know, who can question uh, a US companies, uh, how they do their business? Uh, until now, where to a very large degree there is a sense of alignment. Uh, we have obviously different legal basis. Uh, but in the recent uh, results of the Trade and Technology Council uh, that was held in, in Leuven, uh, you will see that some of the approaches uh, based on, on the Digital Services Act uh, would be much more aligned than what they, uh, what they used to be. Uh, I think also because the tax question to some degree has been settled because of the OECD uh, inclusive approach of 15%. Uh, it, well, it's not implemented, but there has been you know, a lot of progress on that agenda. So that has been eased. Uh, so I think we're at a different pace right now. Also because here in the US, the approach to big tech has changed. From being you know, the, uh, the pride uh, of, uh, of the US economy to be something where one says, hmm, is, is that really what we want? Or shouldn't we question some of the behaviors? Let me follow up on a couple of things there. So on the, on the, on the tax issues, um, I agree that there is this OECD agreement. Mm. It seems pretty clear the US is not going to implement it. Uh, in at least not in the form that it uh, was agreed upon. Um, maybe you're more confident that it will. I worry that it will just unravel and we're going to go back to the situation we had 
eight years ago where various where the European Commission mm -hmm. proposed digital service taxes that were you know, really very much seen as, as sort of tariffs in the digital services sector, I think, by the U.S. administration, by those companies. Um, is that something you're concerned about? You think that that is under control, the, you know, the framework that was constructed through the OECD is going to make sure that that, that situation doesn't return? Well, the, the OECD framework is, is a truly global compromise. Yeah. Um, and we are implemented, implementing it as we speak. Uh, member states are passing yeah. legislation in order to make this happen. And of course, we expect uh, of the U.S. also to pass that. Because the U.S. went out of its way to implement a different global minimum tax from the one agreed upon. And it, but I will not yeah. speculate okay. about okay. that okay. because th those would then be, be uh, choices made that would diverge from now a chosen path that will make tensions go away. And, and I don't see any reasons uh, as to one would want to, to, to do that. I see. Uh, on, the, on the other question, where I, I agree with you, as I said in my opening comments, I think mm. U.S. antitrust policy has moved very much sort of in the direction of folk, even in the, the sort of desired you know, legal foundations that the, I think the mm. FCC sees now, much more focused on company size as an issue, market power as a problem per se. Um, I was talking to a, I think of as a more, you know, more aggressive, antitrust person than, 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 than I would necessarily be the other day. And he said that in, he said sort of in our community, the perception is that the EU really led the way in the 2010s, but now has kind of fallen behind and hasn't been as aggressive when it comes to pursuing some of these competition cases as, as the US has been, as the CMA has been, um, and instead has gone down uh, a much more regulatory path that is you know, not directly using the tools of competition policy. Is that, is that in part, would you agree with that assessment? And is that because you were not satisfied with how the, the pure competition policy-based approach is working? Well, I, I would disagree with that approach. Okay. Uh, and one of the examples would be that we have some of the same cases. Uh, we are more advanced in, in the Google App Tech case than the, the CMA. We're at par, I think, more or less with the DOJ, who has the same case as well. Uh, what I have seen over the years, uh, not one, not two, not three, now the fourth uh, Google case, a couple of Amazon cases, Facebook case, uh, Apple antitrust cases, we just uh, um, decided on that a couple of weeks ago, is that there's been very little learning uh, in the companies, very little change in behavior. Uh, and this, this was why the DMA uh, was conceptualized, that we need, we need to change the approach because otherwise we will, we will get the market that will be increasingly closed and other businesses will have very, very little chances. Uh, I expect a lot of European, uh, of, of US businesses to be the beneficiaries uh, of the Digital Markets Act. For instance, the, non, uh, the, the ban of self-preferencing uh, will be very, very positive for a number of, uh, of businesses, uh, including uh, US businesses for that matter. But the, the Digital Markets Act cannot stand alone. We still need case-by-case case, uh, antitrust uh, enforcement because, in, in my experience, there will be new creative ways of uh, figuring out uh, how not to comply uh, with uh, our uh, legislation that should make sure that the market remains open and contestable. And actually, we do not take issue with size. You're more than welcome to be successful in Europe. Uh, and I think, to some degree, uh, some big tech are more successful in Europe than here. Uh, and the only thing is that we think, well, with market power comes responsibility, and you cannot close the market so that you, big tech, decides who else should be successful. But is it really true? That it's, so if you, the, the application reference, you mean the Spotify yes. case? I mean, Apple Music, to, I mean, what do I know? You know but, uh, I, my sense is that Spotify is the big player in the, in the digital music world, not Apple. And yet somehow Apple is, you know, is fine for being too powerful in that market. Isn't that purely because Apple is a larger company? Within that market, isn't Spotify the dominant force? Well, it goes with, uh, with other music streaming uh, service providers as well, Deezer being one of them. And the case actually is about uh, how to make sure that consumers have choice as to how to pay for services. Because today you have no choice. 
uh, if you want to, to uh, buy uh, an app, you have to pay the 30% uh, Apple tax. Uh, because companies cannot put in a link uh, in their if app. If you want to use the app through your iPhone. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, a completely okay. different yeah. uh, story if you're in an, an Android uh, environment. You cannot, uh, because it's forbidden, contractually forbidden, for companies uh, to steer their consumers mm -hmm. uh, to their own website. Uh, in general, uh, actually very, very difficult for a business to uh, get in touch with their own customers uh, because of Apple restrictions. That is what we have been taking issue with. Um, because we find that is limiting uh, competition. Um, so it's not so much sort of the Spotify versus uh, Apple Music, it is the conditions for consumer choice as to how do I pay. Because some consumers will prefer, I think, uh, to pay uh, through the uh, Apple App Store the 30% fee because of the ease of terminating your subscription, uh, whatever it may be. Others may would like to say, no, I want a direct relationship with my music uh, service provider, so I'd rather go to their website uh, and set up my subscription there. Would, um, I mean, I don't want to go into, into too much detail necessarily, but would it be satisfactory for you if you end up with a situation where if you pay within the iPhone, you pay 30% more than if you go uh, to a different website? Well, what we would want is that um, uh, app uh, developers can put in their apps a link, a button that steers you outside of the Apple ecosystem, and then you can set up your relationship uh, out there. It's also one of the obligations of the Digital Markets Act, not only for music streaming, but also for, for other app developers that they can steer their customers so that they can have a direct uh, uh, provider customer relationship. So one, it's something that Apple, I think, has expressed concerns about, and something Apple claims uh, at least some European intelligence agencies are concerned about is that by routing these relationships around the Apple App Store and the Apple, the, the Apple control payment systems, really the closed Apple world, you're creating security risks, you're creating privacy risks, you're making content moderation more difficult. Do, do you think the, the DMA takes those kinds of trade-offs into account sufficiently? Um, but, but I think that's a, that's a red herring. Uh, I think that's a diversion of the discussion because a company can provide the safety and the security it wants uh, while at the same time providing the choice that comes as an obligation with the DMA. But surely that's harder if you have to accept multiple marketplaces and you can do a little edge vetting on apps. I mean, surely there's some trade-off. But, but we have no reason to, to think that it's, it's more dangerous to sign up with Spotify on their website than to sign up and pay 30% uh, through the sure, Apple sure, payment not, system. Not, not the Spotify, well, maybe, I don't know, you have, right, it means you're, you're handing out your, your financial information to more parties. Um, but, but setting that specific example aside, if, you, if Apple loses control over the apps you can, up, you can install on your phone, surely that poses security risks that have to be separately mitigated. But, but that is, a, is an Apple question. They, they, they need to figure out what kind of product would they want to, to, to sell to their uh, consumers. Well, but because we know we, what they want to sell. Yeah, but they we want have, to sell have, the closed have, system that's secure. We have proven okay. uh, in, in the casework that this is not what is, this is about. This is not a pro about providing extra security uh, for consumers. This is about maintaining a 30% uh, charge uh, and preventing uh, consumers from having choices. Okay, well the consumers can go to Samsung. But, uh, you know, if you're in the high-end uh, uh, world uh, of, uh, of phones, uh, you know, the iPhone is the preferred choice and, and it is part of uh, the market analysis that it's really not the same yeah. uh, markets. Uh, I mean, obviously I agree, and iPhones are much better. That's not, that's, I think, <laughs> without, without dispute. <laughs> it does always remind me a little bit of when people joke about how Twitter has a monopoly over, you know, uh, bird-themed short messaging services, you know, that's a, um, but anyway, so um, uh, that's the DMA. Looking back, of course, a, a, a prior uh, big initiative in the sort of regulation of the digital economy of the GDPR. Um, there have been, I think, a number of studies by economists <laughs> that are quite negative on, on the GDPR, right, who'd say the number of new apps that, that were developed or that were offered in Europe um, dropped by a third or half. 
um, uh, European companies started, you know, just dramatically reducing how much data they uh, they use, they they store. Um, is that on the on the benefit side? I mean, you get a lot of pop-ups. To you know, to, do you want to accept the cookies on this? You know, Dutch newspaper website, and then you can go ahead. Do, do you think that? Do you think that that legislation worked out as well as you'd hoped? Well, I think uh, looking back, that there are things that could have been done differently, but I don't think that undermines the the fundamental logic that you, as a service provider, should take as little data as possible in order to, for instance, identify people. Uh, you should not take data about your whole life in order for you to make a search for, I don't know what, uh, when is the next solar eclipse. That balance is, is not a good balance. Um, I think it's really important that uh, people uh, know that they can control their data uh, because otherwise we, we get into a situation where you have a, a physical world where things are very constrained or a data-driven world where your data is basically everywhere and they are for sale everywhere if you do not have uh, data protection rules. Do you think that ship has sailed already and the data is just kind of out there for sale anyway? I think a lot of data is up for sale. If you go through, if you, if you are interested in, in, in not uh, having cookies and not being tracked, and you look at the number of businesses that is being allowed uh, to take your data, most of them, they are data brokers, which means that your data can flow basically everywhere. Uh, but what I think should should be uh, reconsidered is that it's a very nuanced legislation. Maybe had it been more brutal, it would have been simpler actually to implement. Um, we have had a, a second uh, go on how people are informed uh, because I think the, the, the rule of thumb is that if you're presented with half a page, you may actually read it. If you're presented with a full page, you read 20%. If you're presented with 10 pages, you read nothing. So that strikes me as optimistic. But I think that's yeah. optimistic. Yeah. But a lot of games are being played in order to prevent people uh, from actually exercising their rights. And I think one could have a second go as to how, how do we get there. Also, if you look at your choices, you'd see that uh, you can either have the slider in gray or darker gray. What is a yes, please take my data, and what is no, please don't, is absolutely opaque. And I think that shows that we also need to make sure that consumers have ease uh, of actually exercising their rights. How do you think of the, the sort of nature of data? Is that, a, is that a capital good? Is it something that's constantly getting generated a little more like labor? What's the, <coughs> how, I just, I struggle to, like, do consumers really, they, I understand there are certain bits of private information that people really care about. But just the day-to-day, -day, if you click around a website, is that something, are there real privacy interests involved there? Well, you probably remember the case where a, a, a company based on, on the data they had started pushing you know, uh, pregnancy um, mm -hmm. uh, goods to a woman who did not know she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. But based on, on the data out there- So it worked there, really well. They, they would not, yes, it works really <laughs> well. Uh, maybe a bit too well, uh, actually. Uh, but I think as, as, uh, as data, as, as one of the uh, vehicles, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that will push our world forward, I think there's no doubt about that. Uh, and I think it- Because it is, of course, the key, the key input for, for AI models, right? It's not, not for some AI models, yes, you also have AI models who actually are not fed with data beforehand, but start learning uh, mm -hmm. basically independently. So you can have both. But if you want to be able to know how your AI is reacting, you need to know what kind of data do I feed it with? Uh, because there are immense differences uh, between uh, populations, between nations, uh, how that would work health-wise. And if you're not in control of your data, you will not know how the biases will be. And being in control of biases is essential. Of course, mathematically, uh, every AI eventually will have one kind of bias, but you just need to make sure that that bias works for you and for the purpose of that AI. But the data that is being created as we speak is enormous. The throes of data that has been made available by now uh, and com combining it with AI should accelerate a lot of things that we know of, like, uh, of course, healthcare, but also research in general can work much, much faster 
uh, than what we have previously seen. Because you can do a lot of things that you earlier on was obliged to do in the physical world with great cost, with a lot of trouble. You can do that in, in a, an AI simulated environment before you get to cl clinical trials based on the data and based on the power uh, of the algorithm. And I think that is just amazing perspectives. But isn't the, data, the, the healthcare data you need for that, isn't that exactly the kind of data that people are most concerned about sharing? The Which is also why one needs to, to be able to uh, give the comfort that their data is not being used for things that they do not approve of. Uh, again, to create trust that this is actually a good thing. Um, in, for instance, in the Danish context, uh, they have fed uh, an algorithm, uh, the journals of, I think, 76,000 patients with, I think, colon cancer. Uh, in order to give uh, decision support for, um, uh, for doctors as to how to treat uh, this cancer patient. And they have halved the number of complications from the treatment, which of course is of enormous benefit for the patient, and you save quite a lot of money in the health system. And that is done uh, with uh, the GDPR uh, environment, uh, of course, upheld. I always think that one way for the UK to have a productive role in the world would be for them to make the NHS data open access. You don't have to, you know, have to do that. <laughs> Let's take a few questions from our, from our uh, audience. Um, let's go over there all the way on the left. Alexander, please wait for the mic and then briefly introduce yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this. Um, Alexander van der Horst. I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist and I'm chair of the physics department at the George Washington University. Um, so, uh, I mean, AI is all over in, in our research, um, and of course also there's a huge discussions at universities in edu higher education um, about the use of AI. But um, one of the aspects that I'm, um, I'm actually kind of surprised doesn't come up more often, and I wanted to kind of like um, hear your thoughts on this, is the kind of green aspect of this, right? So, uh, I mean, as in my research, I do a lot of work with um, big data. Um, I know what the limitations are just of the power that you need to do some mm -hmm. of this work. Um, and um, a lot of the AI just needs a lot of power to work. And, um, and our limitations, basically, we're, uh, we have to go into green computing, quantum computing, mm -hmm. et cetera, to actually be able to do this. But big companies have a lot of money, can just say, well, we're just going to build another power plant to make this work, which has enormous implications. Um, also climate change, et cetera. So um, what are, it, is this part of any of the conversations, discussions when it comes to regulations, um, this kind of green aspect um, of, the, of the AI and other similar technologies? Well, I completely agree on, on the concern, uh, also because uh, AI is pushed as an equal alternative to a sort of an old school search. An old school search will very often just give you the result and that will be sort of the energy use of a cup of coffee or something like that. Where if you use an AI for the same, you know, it will travel the entire planet and the AI use will be, I don't know, like driving a car 20 kilometers. So there's really no comparison. And, uh, and this means that the chips, uh, you did, the GPUs, they have to be much, much more energy efficient. Uh, I think that innovation is happening basically as we speak. But it's not good enough in my book to say, yeah, but our, our data center is powered by windmills. Well, there could be an alternative use of that energy uh, because we're in a situation where the production uh, is actually limited uh, when, until we get to, to, uh, to, to the next generation of, uh, of, uh, of nuclear energy, that will be the case, that we are in a limited uh, energy scenario. So that is in, indeed a, a very important uh, uh, subject. What, uh, what to do about it, we are not planning sort of uh, regulatory uh, approaches to it, but I think it, it must be core uh, of the discussion. Because just as well as, as uh, artificial intelligence is a huge part of the solution, it cannot increase the problem at the same time. Let's go over here up front. Uh, Carl Zabo, Net Choice, quick question for you. Um, so you talked a lot about the necessary alignment between antitrust views and enforcement in the EU and the US and the recent changes there. One of the things that you also talked about is how you're oftentimes bringing the same cases. How do you make sure that you're not tripping over each other's toes between US enforcers and the EU 
uh, the, the data that you collect, is it coming back to America so that they can produce the enforcement here? How do you coordinate with U.S. enforcers on antitrust law to make sure that you both are, are kind of not, you know? And, and that's a huge responsibility on our side, uh, both when it comes to merger control that when we have the necessary waivers and a merger is notifiable in both jurisdictions, that we uh, discuss to figure out if we have the same concerns, could uh, one remedy then solve it? That makes it much easier for the business in, in question not to have to deal with two separate approaches. Uh, so you can basically uh, kill two birds with one stone. So that, I think, is a very obvious business benefit uh, with coordination where everyone is on a, on a much shorter sort of uh, calendar than when you look at antitrust. Uh, same with antitrust investigations. When we have the necessary waivers, we can compare notes, uh, and we do that uh, in order to make sure that uh, don't, both we don't oversee something, but also that we do not overthink uh, something in order to scope uh, the cases in the best possible way. Uh, and I think the only way not to indeed step uh, on, on each other's toes is that very close cooperation. Uh, we have, uh, it will take place this week, we have a sibling to the Trade and Technology Council, which is a uh, technology competition policy dialogue, where we have also the more sort of horizontal discussion about uh, what is happening right now. For instance, about how will AI change market dynamics. It's important to have that discussion before we have the specific cases, again, in order to align. So it's a very close cooperation. So case teams will travel or case team will meet uh, virtually uh, in order if they have the permission from the companies uh, to be able to coordinate. Let's go to Pat. Let's go to Pat over here. First of all, thank you very much for being here and taking some difficult questions. We appreciate it. Um, you made a comparison of emerging technology, particularly AI, to nuclear energy, and that there is a significant value in having nuclear energy, and I fundamentally agree with that. But I look at the world of nuclear energy, and in the United States, in uh, the later part of the 20th century, we implemented the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and production of nuclear energy and production of new reactors effectively stopped. And just recently in the European Union, the largest member state in terms of population and economy has taken all of its nuclear reactors offline. Um, is there a concern that a similar approach to technology is now taking place where we understand the benefit of it, but the precautionary principle is going to overrule the necessary use cases? I think that's a, it's a very interesting parallel. Um, I think one needs to consider the risk that some will say, mm, no way, this is, this is too dangerous, and, and withdraw. Uh, and this is why it's so important for us to create uh, the trust that we can actually uh, be in control of the risks in order for everyone to embrace uh, the benefits that comes from it. And things that you keep in arm's length, well, you can literally not embrace it. So, so that would be the point. Because we see the risk. We already have, uh, you know, uh, just in, in sort of old school digitization, digital divides. Part of the population who feel that they are not included in digital solutions. They do not feel that they have the skills uh, to take part. They definitely do not have the skills to be part of developing technology. So in order uh, to bridge that, of course, that's a question for education and, and uh, enabling people to be included. But if we do not create the trust that technology as powerful as AI can be made to serve people, I think that is a risk. And I think it's very important to use that risk as a driver to make sure that we get it right. Because I, I think there are so many uh, problems of humanities that will be solvable with artificial intelligence. So a withdrawal from that technology will create its, its own enormous problems. Thank you. Let's go to Shane. Good morning. It's Shane Tease with the American Enterprise Institute. So going back to your point about um, positive, you know, com wanting companies to be able to have access you know, to more things when you were talking about like the App Store. I, I do cybersecurity and this, the interest in the concerns around what we are opening up with the App Store is really sincere because sort of when you're in cybersecurity, you think about criminals have one goal in mind. It's just finding that weak link and getting in there. And 
what you're doing with taking the, with, with Apple specifically, because of the way that their thing is designed, is you're taking the guardrails down, and that is allowing more criminal activity to enable these devices, which everyone has in their hand all the time. So they, you're helping enable the easiest point of entry for them. And it reminds me, because I also do a lot of work in privacy, and I, I completely see your point about less data is actually the, probably our better way to go on that. But with GDPR and your NIST II standards, doing compliance has confl you know, conflicted a lot of companies on trying to figure out how to do security by design and also follow the guidance of your privacy rules. And I feel like you've, you've put us in another similar situation with trying to comply with DMA and also keep the consumers secure. So I'm hoping that as this progresses, I know Nokia does a study every year and we're interested to see if they're gonna be looking at this as something that has happened. W you know, will you take a look back if we start to see this is a very real problem with you, the security by design that's currently on the system being broken by the DMA? But I, I don't uh, agree with the premise uh, for that question. Uh, that security is something that the DMA uh, addresses or not. I think security is, is very much a choice for the company. Uh, Google has made different choices. Apple has made their choices. Uh, they will figure out what are the choices for the future. And consumers have choices too. If you don't want to have a second app store, if you don't want to be steered outside uh, of the app store, you're perfectly, uh, uh, it's perfectly legitimate that you do that, that you can stay completely within that wall garden of Apple. That's your choice. The problem is that some of us do not have that choice as it is right now. You know, I cannot have an app store that is specific for um, um, uh, apps that are safe for young people. Uh, I don't hear any complaints about uh, the app stores that are there under the radar for uh, security apps. Uh, here we have no complaints. So I think it's really important to see that as an opportunity to serve customers better. And uh, I think it's really important uh, not to say, well, because of this and this, unfortunately, I cannot follow the law of the land. I think that is very, very far reaching to say, well, I will not accept the law. That has been passed by a parliament, by a council, uh, and you sit back with crossed arms and say, I don't accept it. That, that, is not, that is not expected company behavior. We, we have a hard stop at nine, so let's take two questions. Let's go over there, all the way on the left, and then over here. I'm Evie Downey, Associate Dean for Research in the College of Arts and Sciences at GW. I think this is a fascinating discussion. AI has tremendous possibilities. But when you talk about regulation of data and making choices available to consumers, I think that's fantastic. But it's only effective and meaningful if the consumers understand the ramifications of those choices. What efforts are being made to educate people at a stage before they start having their first iPhone, so that before they start releasing data, they understand what those choices mean and what they imply for later in their life? Let's hold on, let's mm -hmm. take a second question and then we hear up front. Steve Del Bianco, I'm anxious to know how you would measure the success of your approach and your enforcement measures. If you look back a few years from now, how will you know that anything you did improved the condition for small businesses in Europe? How will you know that consumers are any more protected than they were before? I would love to know what data you are gathering now to compare whether your approach has actually helped to accomplish any of the goals that you've set out. On, uh, on the first question, um, I think we have a, a gigantic challenge ahead of us uh, also for, uh, for consumers to understand, for instance, money. You know, when I was a child, my, my grandmother, she would give me 20 Danish crowns and say, go buy yourself an ice cream. Now, I have a grandson. He will not accept cash. <laughs> <laughs> because how, well, what to do with it? You know, the Danish economy, you, you can tap and go everywhere. You know, even homeless people, they will accept uh, tap and go, basically. S but how for him to understand the value of, of, uh, of money? So it's not only here in what choices do we have when relating with social uh, media, it is in general uh, to understand what is a digital world when things are not tangible uh, anymore. 
where we have a, a road to establish that understanding is when people see that they are uh, exposed to just old school plain fraud. Because that can be understand, understood by everyone. So you have a seemingly well-known TV personality, you meet this person, uh, in social media, it's trying to sell you something. It was never that TV personality. The product they sell you is never something safe. And here people say, hmm, that, that is not right. And when responding to that, you know, asking for that content to be taken down because it's an illegal deep fake, uh, you create a bridge for people to understand in general, oh, maybe I need to know how to protect myself better because they are exposed to really old school uh, criminality. In general, I think one should be aware that criminals digitalize so much faster than most small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, and, and that ought to be a call to action uh, because we see a lot of very sort of old school fraud uh, in that sector because they do not protect themselves. On the second question, how to measure success? Uh, it's a difficult question. Um, it, it's not in, in the tech sector. Quite some years ago, we had a uh, antitrust case in beers. So against two giant uh, uh, beer brewers uh, in Europe, there was a question of uh, disabling sort of parallel imports so that beers were more expensive in Belgium, and they love beer. Um, and I was at a cafe one day with my youngest daughter, and when we're leaving, there's a woman uh, sitting sort of at the bar who reaches out and she looks at my daughter and she said, you can be proud of your mom. And she was like, hmm, why? That, I don't know that woman, why is she talking to me? And, and then she said, listen, I'm also a brewer. I have a small brewery and because of the work of your mom, I have a better chance in getting out there, competing, selling my beers. That was close to being the best day of my life. <laughs> because my daughter understood what it is that I'm doing and what gets me up in the morning, enabling people to do their business. That was at least one example. Because I think that is what drives a competitive economy, that people can do their business without other businesses deciding whether they should be successful or not. So the more businesses we see thriving, and of course there are data of, of, of that sort, uh, the better. And, and this is why we have the ban of, of self-preferencing, because then you open the marketplace for all kinds of services. Uh, this is why we have the obligation to say, well, maybe you want a second app store, because just as here, if you don't like the prices and the choices in one shop, you go to another one. So the whole effort is about creating opportunity. And I think a dynamic some, uh, society has that obligation to create opportunity uh, for people with the work ethics and the ideas and the talent uh, to make it. Not a super specific metric, but I think a very good answer. Uh, no, thank, uh, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming to, <laughs> to AEI. Uh, to our audience, thank you for coming today. On, on June 6th, uh, I'll be hosting an event on the European Parliament elections that will commence that day and, and go on until Sunday. Please come back for that um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much.